Hi, this is Wayne Zell and welcome back to Blueprint for Wealth, another episode that's designed to help you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. And we focus on entrepreneurs and people who help entrepreneurs. And today my special guest is Holly Jean Jackson, who is a revenue transformer. Holly, Holly Jean, welcome to the show. Cause we're, I'm told that we shouldn't just, just call you Holly because there is a woman who writes murder books and she is not what we're talking about today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the revenue transformer, not the murder person. So don't <laughs> call me if you're in need of covering up a murder y'all just saying. <laughs> I hear the y'all. Where are you from? Uh, I'm actually from Chicago, but oh. I call North Carolina home. I've been here for a long time. My nephews live here and so I moved back here to be near them. Cool. Where in North Carolina are you located? Raleigh. Excellent. Excellent city. Lots of business going on there. Lots of growth in, in North Carolina, all over North Carolina. It's very exciting to see that. So tell me a little bit about your pre-revenue transformer days. How did you get into becoming a revenue transformer for people? <laughs> I feel like I need to be on the transformer you know, movie or something right now, but Anyhow, I digress. It was kind of a windy path, honestly. So I started off in the nonprofit space while I was getting my graduate degree and worked on at the Institute for Emerging Issues as a policy person because that's cool. what I was getting my degree in. Then uh, I was married at the time. We moved across the country to California and found that I needed to double my salary. So I started working for a university and they hired me as a director of relationship management and trained me in technology because I knew nothing about technology at the time. And so they taught me across um, ITIL, which is, you know, nerdy, nerd speak for learning all the things in IT at a very high level. And did that for a while and worked in corporate America at Safeway, Visa, Treasury Wine Estates, and just climbed the corporate ladder quite successfully. But Alongside that, I kept getting layoff after layoff, even as a top performer and really an intrapreneur. So I was creating programs, products, services, systems that worked globally for a company within that safety net. And I got really tired of not having that safe container to grow in and not having the loyalty for my employer. And so after my fourth layoff, I said, I'm done. I took one more job. And then I went out to my network of people I'd worked with previously and got a part-time consulting gig that replaced my corporate income so that I had the finances to grow my business on the side part-time. That took about a year and a half. And now here we are. What was your vision for this? And what is your vision for this? You know, my vision initially was around healing. So my layoffs were actually coupled with pretty severe health challenges because that environment just was toxic for me. And so initially I started off as a health coach, I actually. And then I realized that to heal more people and have a bigger impact, I had this imposter syndrome of helping entrepreneurs and business owners. And I'm like, well, what are you waiting for? You've done this for a long time. You're really good at it. And so I finally stepped into that. And then for a few years, I did holistic business coaching. And I actually specialized in targeting and working with holistic business owners. So chiropractors, doctors, wellness centers. Sure. But then they, you know, during the pandemic, the, the finances kind of dried up in those containers, saw the writing on the wall. And so then I pivoted to broaden my niche and really dove into revenue and performance consulting because... The coaching work that I did, the challenge was a lot of these small business owners didn't have capacity to actually develop the standard operating procedures, templates, and systems to you know actually create the systems to generate more revenue. And since I've done that, the business has exploded. So my vision now, so to answer your question, is yeah. to heal the world by helping really good heart-centered business owners who are doing good in their communities and through their services go big so they can give big. I love that. I mean, heart centered, somebody who really has the best interests of the community and people they serve at heart, as opposed to just being in it for the almighty dollar. Yeah. I mean, luckily we're at a place of business. We're growing a hundred percent year over year. Yeah, that's correct. It's crazy. And so we can be really picky with the clients we work with and the partners that we choose to bring on board. And so we're very fortunate. We have an amazing tribe, amazing vibes, and our clients are growing exponentially as well. So how big is your company today? 
Mm. We have about six people on staff. They're independent contractors at this point, and we're actually probably onboarding two more. And you've you've got your own system. I, I, I was reading uh, about the uh, uh, the fear method, which yeah. when somebody when I see fear, I go, oh, I don't want to. I don't want to adopt that as my method for improving my revenue performance. It's like instill fear in everybody. No. Tell us about the fear method. I know it's face it, embrace curiosity, advocate, and reach out. But tell us how you came up with that and why it's gaining traction in your business. Yeah. So the fear method came about during the pandemic. I landed a TED talk and I had just published my first best selling book. And I had a chapter in there on navigating chronic pain. And so I wanted to do a talk that helps people that Can were. I, read that? I need to read that chapter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. The book is called Inspiration Contagion, the same name as my podcast. You can find it on Audible, Amazon, um, all the places. Inspiration and Contagion. Yes. The I'm subtitle, this down. The subtitle is Health Secrets for Raving Success. Awesome. Keep going. Yeah. So from that, I wanted to make sure that it was still aligned with the theme for that year for TED, which that year was uh, navigating a new era, right? And so I my topic became navigating a new era of uncertainty. And I realized that the strategies in that chapter that I could really apply how you navigate chronic pain to navigating challenges and struggle in life. They're all really the same. So I took those seven strategies, condensed them into a four-step process that created the fear methodology. And my story, if you guys have seen my TED Talk, if you haven't, watch it. That's why it's recorded because I'm famous for the bear story and I got tired of telling it all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love telling it, but you know, when you're having coffee or drinks with friends and you tell it a million times, it gets old after a while. So I'm like, here's my TED Talk. Go scan it. Go watch it. Um, <laughs> But it's about facing a bear in the woods and, you know, living through that and the transformational work that I was doing through the divorce I was going through, the huh. changes in my life I was going through, the struggles, the pain. And in that experience, I talk about how perhaps you haven't faced your bear, and I hope you never have to actually face a real bear, but we all have bears in our life. We all have pain. We all have struggle. We have, you know, perhaps a difficult business partnership we need to leave. So whatever that is, the fear methodology can help you get through that and take the right action, the right next step. And so, so give, us a, give us an example of how that might work. Yeah. So let's say you are in your business struggling with a partnership that's gone wrong. Okay. Well, if you use the fear methodology, the first step is face it. Stop denying that there's not a problem okay. and ignoring it. All right. So the acceptance is key first. And then embrace curiosity and creativity. That means, okay, well, can, are there creative ways that we can actually rectify and put this partnership back on track? Are there creative ways I can have a really dynamic and difficult conversation with this partner where we can actually have fruitful outcomes that are going to help move the business forward where everybody wins? And if not, how can I creatively move forward with exiting this partnership in a way that's going to help me open up, let go of space so that I can actually create more capacity for what I want more of in my business? And then if you go to the A in the fear method of advocating for what you want or need, now that you've faced it and you've gotten some creativity around it, you can advocate for what you want next because you have clarity around what that is. So you can say to your business partner, hey, let's brainstorm on this and solve this and see how we can move forward. Or, hey, it's time to part ways. Let's have that conversation. I realize this is difficult. This is how I'd like to proceed on doing that. And then R is reach out. So let's say your creativity got stuck and you don't have all the answers. You need additional support. You could go to um, an exit strategy expert. You could go to a coach. Yeah, all the things. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that. And I like how you couched it in terms of an acronym that's really easy to remember. <laughs> we won't forget that acronym at all. Um, tell me about one of the more challenging situations that you faced in helping a client get back on track when they were off track and how, how you helped them navigate through it um, and lessons that you learned that you can impart to other clients today. 
Yeah. So it's interesting. I was actually just speaking with one of my collaboration partners before this call, and we were talking about how you can have all the right systems in place. You can have your standard operating procedure. You can have your team. All that can be exactly positioned the way it should be. And then sometimes, even with all those right steps, we find that a client might not be hitting the numbers that we would expect when we have that dialed in. Typically, when this happens, there are actual things in their personal life or things from an alignment perspective or a mindset perspective that are grossly out of alignment. And I am not like an expert in that space, but I, I do have clients where we get stuck and we'll have the perfect standard operating procedure, the perfect steps. We'll do all these things and we're still not hitting the right numbers. So then we have a conversation around typically a couple of different things. Usually it's about money, their relationship with money. Okay. And so one of the more powerful tools I use with clients to one, uncover, face what the actual problem is, is to write a letter to money. And I want them to write about all of the terrible things, wonderful things, beliefs, thoughts, things that they hate about it in this letter. And then I have them come back to the next session and I'm like, great, your money, your money, the person, the energy. I'm going to read the letter you just wrote. How do you feel? about what you said to money as money. And they're like, oh my gosh, Holly, I totally understand why I am not receiving money, why I'm not a good steward of money. And now I have clarity on what I need to reframe, repurpose, and, and actually rethink so that I can have better sales conversations, be a better steward of money, and pay it forward. So that's just one example on the mindset side of where we have all the right systems in place, all the right alignment in place, and yet there's something between these two ears where people get stuck. That's interesting. You know, it, it's um, I don't, it takes a, a unique individual who's very empathetic to be able to do what you do be, so that you can uh, identify that issue, but also make sure that you're able to articulate it in a way that doesn't threaten the person, but makes, you know, gives them constructive coaching uh, through that process. Do you also help them with systems and with uh, sales processes and other things that you've probably experienced in your long corporate career? Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, we don't necessarily start with the mindset piece. Usually we start with those operational bits, the standard operating procedures, the templates, the systems, the automation, the impact filters, all of those things that help somebody be successful that unfortunately small business owners don't typically have access to. They haven't had the training. They haven't had the education. They haven't had any of that. And so that's where we start. But mm -hmm. then if we still see that they're, they're not getting results that we should be seeing, that's where we dig into, okay, what does a sales conversation look like? What's going on behind the curtains here? Because the outcomes aren't where they should be. And there's usually a reason for that. Have you ever had a situation where you're hired as a revenue enhancer, a revenue performance enhancer, and it doesn't work out? And um, what what is the example that you could... Conf not confidentially publicly announce what what uh, what situation arose where you just couldn't get through to the client and why <clears throat> yeah so the only time that happens is when you have a client who you do the work you give them the standard operating procedures you give them the system and they don't use it so uh yeah if you're not going to use what you've hired me to build for you what uh, you've hired me to implement for you Mm -hmm. then of course it doesn't work. Um, and, and sometimes this happens because people exit a business or they have other drama that occurs in their business or they're just not ready for it right. or they're not in a place of capacity planning. Like we'll suddenly start to get results and it'll spike and they start freaking out. They're like, oh, wait, 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 let's pull back. Um, Why? But <laughs> <laughs> Why would you pull back? Wait a second. I just they're not ready to enhance my revenue. And she tells me all these great things on how to do it and gives me all these processes and tools and technology and templates. And then it, it happens. And then it's like, oh, no, no, no. We, we really don't want to do that now. Really? Well, the, the Seriously? Irony, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the irony is sometimes uh, it grows so quickly for people mm. that they just don't have, they're not ready. They don't have the capacity to handle it. And that's why we also look at scalability of what they're putting out there so that we can make sure that the systems that we're putting out there, we're not growing too quickly for them. So we don't lose the quality of customer service that they're offering because our clients are mostly service-based. So that's something we've added and layered into like the beginning of the process working with them is 
looking at their product pyramid, doing some capacity planning, making sure that they can and are prepared to staff up quickly because pretty frequently we, when we work with our clients, it does grow pretty fast. I mean, we're growing 100% a year. That's crazy growth, you guys. And so our clients are typically growing anywhere from, I'd say, 30 to 120% year over year, which is wow. also very high. And so that's capacity you have to be prepared for. What businesses do you typically work with? What types of business? You said the service-oriented businesses, but give us some examples of the industries that you're working in. We have a pretty broad range, but a lot, I'd say the largest percentage fall into professional services. So think marketing agencies, financial um, planners and firms, family firms, typically they're smaller in scale. Um, think insurance industry, attorneys, occasionally doctors. We also have from the old world of marketing, we did a lot of holistic wellness uh, practitioners that have service-based businesses that we work with as well. And then mm -hmm. we have some uh, quite a few speakers and authors that also have a business movement or a nonprofit that they're trying to scale from. So that's typically where it falls into. And occasionally we work with some startups as well. What size business is the ideal client for you? Yeah. So we work truly with small business owners. So it's anywhere from one to 20 employees typically. Um, and I'd say most of the clients we work with are usually six to nine figures and they're just scaling up from there. And I, that, I know that's a huge range, but literally six to nine figures. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a big range. Yeah. But I mean, it's interesting. I, I used to get imposter syndrome when I'd have like a nine figure business owner hire me, but we've helped them grow so much that it is truly six to nine figures and we can help the six figures get to seven figures, the eight figures get to nine figures. And it just works effectively across all the ranges. You've used a term twice now in our conversation, imposter syndrome. Tell me what you mean by that. Yeah. So imposter syndrome, especially if you guys saw Inside Out recently, the second one, it's brilliant. You should watch it. I think like uh, you've got one of those little characters in there and it's telling you like the fear character, you can't do that. Or maybe it's anxiety. And she's like, you're not capable of this. Or mm -hmm. you don't have the degree or the MD behind your name to do that thing. So it's that kind of negative nagging little character in your head that says you can't, you won't, you shouldn't, you couldn't. And those are words you should never be using because the, you know your words and your focus creates your reality. So be careful and mindful of that. But it's something that still comes up for all of us, even if you work well with it. But I just remember when I started it being a lot bigger, it was like this massive character in my head and it was exhausting. And now it's kind of this teeny thing where I'm like, oh, go away, go in the back seat. Well, you gain that with experience and and try trial, trial, trial and error, you know, doing the things that you think work and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. We all go through that. I've been doing it so long, though, I, I better keep refreshing my memory as to what it was like to be in, in the position of, you know, are you afraid to say something? Are you afraid to make a suggestion here or to upset the apple cart or to get into hard negotiations or hard discussions about what it is that you're doing? So I, I think it's really, it's fascinating. Your metamorphosis, it's, uh, you know, again, you were in corporate America for a while and then you took that expertise and you've parlayed it in many different directions. What's the most exciting event that you've had so far in your 12 years as the revenue transformer? Ooh, that is a really good question that I have not been asked in a long time. Um, I don't know. There's one event. I would say that the book is probably the one that means the most to me because I, from my, so I have a very long list of chronic pain that I've dealt with personally, which most people don't necessarily know unless they've listened to the podcast or they've listened to the TED talk or they've read the book. It's not something I talk about a lot because again, where we focus, that's where our energy flows. And so I have multiple chronic pain conditions. The book is Inspiration Contagion, Health Secrets for Raving Success. And I originally, every time I tried to write it, it was about pain and that felt really hard to write. So when I reframed it to inspire and heal others and share my experience of how I got there um, and speak to chronic pain and people that are struggling in really significant ways, that felt more empowering. And I think the most rewarding thing from that has been, I'm getting goosebumps as I share this. 
the people who have a parent that has cancer as a diagnosis and they read this book and they're inspired and they've actually come back cancer free or people that have read this book and they had endometriosis or significant pain that took away their entire identity because pain became their world. And they read the book and they're like, thank you for reminding me there's another way that there's a possibility to get out of this. And it's incredible that you have a 10 level spinal fusion and yet you are crushing it in your business. You're a rock climber. You're refusing what the doctors are telling you about being disabled. Um, and thank you for that. Yeah. That's the key. (laughs) Don't listen to the doctors. Um, it is. And there's a whole chapter on uh, self-talk, a whole I'm chapter ordering, on self-talk. <laughs> I'm ordering that book today. I, I've had chronic pain since I was 17 and uh, I've had cancer multiple times. Um, it, I understand what it is to live with chronic pain and, uh, and to perform and do it well and do your best. But I, I'm always learning new things and uh, you're going to teach me something when I read your book, because I think that's that's a, a, it's brilliant that you've been able to overcome this and be successful and maintain that success. And, you know, we have this pain, but we try, the goal is not to focus on it. It's to focus on the stuff that gives you exhilaration and passion. Yeah. And so that's, that's beautiful. So it was a bestseller, Inspiration Contagion. You've written other books though, haven't you? Yes, I've done a couple other collaboration books. Um, I'm drawing a blank on it right now, but I did one with Matt Rouse and D. Scott Smith. It's a short form book. And then I also have another collaboration that's coming out at the end of this year that's a brave business book with Brave Healer Productions, my publisher. And I wrote a chapter in that on revenue maximization that's going to be really, really powerful. And it tells a really vulnerable story that you're only going to read there. So make sure you get it. <laughs> and but that's coming taking, out in October. So Are you taking on new clients? That's another question for you. I am. I will say we are close to capacity, meaning we will probably have a waiting list soon. So if you have a big problem that you need to plug a profit leak, you should get on the list ASAP so that we can actually serve you right away. Beautiful. And in all types of professional service industries, including healthcare, law, accounting, et cetera. I mean, anybody who's rent marketing, marketing firms, that's, that's great to know that because we have a lot of relationships like that. Um, couple more questions for you, then I'll let you go. How, have you ever run across a client that didn't want to change, even though they needed your blueprint for wealth? And, um, and if you, came across that and they, you know, a lot of clients are resistant. I don't want to do this. It's too complicated. It's too expensive. It's blah, 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 blah. How did you break through to convince them to use you to do what you do best? Well, I would say in the early days of our business, I had that because I made the mistake of taking on clients that I knew intuitively weren't a good fit. I'd say now we don't have that because I'm very selective and I listen to my intuition. If somebody's difficult or I feel like I'm chasing them at all, I'm not chasing anybody. I don't need to chase anybody anymore. So uh, because of that shift and that knowledge and the strategies that we use today, we rarely, if ever, fall into that. And quite frankly, if we do today, which has happened maybe one time out of 200, we just part ways and end the contract and refund them because it's not worth my time, energy, or our reputation to do anything else. Um, But initially back in the day where I did take on clients and did listen to intuition, uh, it was a lot of work. It was pretty exhausting. And and that's really why in our intake form, it says, you know, are you ready to take action come hell or high water in your business? Yes or no. If they say no, we cancel the call. Are you ready to invest in your business? Yes or no. If they say no, we cancel the call. And we also ask some specific questions that if they answer a specific way, we just say this isn't a fit and we can refer you to somebody else, but this is not a fit. So we I have I'm like I'm going to learn more from you than I've learned in a, in a month from anybody. This is great. Well, I thank you. That. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. No, I, I mean, I have a, a, a law practice that's been around for many, many years, and we do exit planning and, as part of our practice. And you, it's hard to screen people initially to figure out if there's a fit, not only, for, you know, for, in terms of fees and things like that, but more importantly, in terms of their attitude. Because yeah. if they don't want to work with you, or if they are always skeptical about what you're doing, or they're cynical about the, you know, the work that you're, you're trying to help them with. It's not going to be a good fit from the very beginning. 
And so yeah. there are questions that should be asked and I'm going to get on your waiting list. <laughs> you should. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting because the other question that I ask um, on the sales call before I open the door to inviting them to work with us is this needs to feel like a hell yes. So are you feeling like a hell yes and working together? And if they say no, I'm like, cool, come back to us when it feels like it's more aligned and you trust us and you're ready to take that stuff forward. And if we can refer you to somebody else, I'm happy to do that. But <laughs> if it's not a hell yes, then it's a hell no. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, I like it. What's the most unconventional or daring piece of advice you've ever given to somebody about building their, their business and their wealth? Ooh, most unconventional. I mean, well, I think a lot of people would say that I am woo woo. Um, so I would say a lot of it is woo woo. Yeah. Meaning like spiritual or oh, out good. there or, but I mean, yeah, I am. So that's who we market to. That's who we attract. And if that's not your vibe, then we're not your tribe and that's cool. Um, <laughs> so it's really about the, the most unconventional wisdom. It would be stop doing what everybody else is telling you to do. Stop listening to the naysayers because all they're trying to do is anchor you down in a negative way and truly listen to the legacy that you want to leave behind, which, which means that's not simple. It means define success on your own, removing all of the mentors, people, society, which is very difficult to do. What does success mean to you? And I'm not talking about dollars. I'm talking about when you die, what do you want to be remembered for? What do you want to have moved forward in this lifetime? If you do that correctly and you are that inspired every single day and you take 1% you know, action towards that every day, you are going to be incredibly successful, both financially, but also you're going to be fulfilled. So stop listening to other people. Stop comparing yourself. Stop the compare and despair of BS on uh, social media. I will tell you because I've seen behind the curtains of a lot of business owners, a lot of it's smoke and mirrors. So stop comparing because the story that they're telling online is probably not true. And then just do what feels aligned to you on your own terms. Outstanding. We are talking with Holly Jean Jackson, who is a guru in revenue transformation but also holistic health. Um, I think it's really important to understand the confluence of those two things, how business relates to your health, how your health relates to your business, and how you can make both work in tandem and work well together. So thank you so much for your guidance today. It's been a, it's been a great podcast. Yeah, thank you for great questions and a great team and making this a very smooth process. You're very welcome. Have a wonderful week to yourself and to all our listeners out there. Have a great couple of weeks and we'll be back with another special guest on Blueprint for Wealth. See you soon.